We continue today in the Sermon on the Mount. We have been going through bit by bit. If you think our sermons are long, this one is huge. <laughs> but every morsel of it is challenging. So we're taking it morsels by morsels. And here is today's part. This is from the Gospel of Matthew chapter five, if you're following along. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord this day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, open these words for us and open our spirits to receive them. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, that's easy, isn't it? No problem. We'll just love all of our enemies and everything will be happy and it's all going to turn out right. That works, right? I think this is one of the more uh, challenging portions of the Bible, partly because it's so clear and so difficult at the same time. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. There is that saying of keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. And the idea behind that is that way you know what your enemies are doing and follow all their Twitter feeds and make sure that there are no leaks. But I think that what Jesus is telling us is to keep our enemies closer in a very different way. To keep our enemies closer to our hearts and closer to their rightful place in God's kingdom. And in the meantime, to love ourselves too and to keep ourselves close to God and our rightful place in God's kingdom, to keep ourselves from becoming the enemy that we so despise. The words are simple, but there's also some cultural unpacking that it's important to do when we read this passage. Often when we think about who are our enemies, some of the first things that come to mind are the people who drive us crazy. The people that make us very mad, the people who just make us want to do things that would be considered unchristian. They're people who sap our energy and our power. But it's important to know that enemies had a more particular meaning in this case. In the Hebrew context, to be a friend or neighbor was to be kin, to be family. To do the things for family that the things for family do. Even when you disagree, you show up and you help them pack when they move. Even when they are struggling, you give what you can to help them out. People tended to do that for family. Not so much for those who were not family. Not so much who were enemies or alien. It also had a sense of oppressor. A sense of anyone who sought to do you harm. Anyone who might be uh, doing things that would actually be painful for you. In the political context, 
it was very much a sense of the Roman occupiers who were oppressing the Jewish people at the time. For Jesus to say, love your enemies, it meant the Roman centurion who could at any moment order you to pick up his 75 pound backpack and walk a mile with it. To love those enemies meant to find ways to love those who made your very life miserable. This is tough. It's hard to think about ways that we could love our enemies that don't also require us to be a doormat. But that is where some interpretation of this passage becomes very important. And there are a few key words. I don't know if you want to follow along in this in your Bible, if it would help for you. It's in Matthew, which is like two-thirds of the way through the Bible, and then chapter 5, and then verse 38. You don't have to, but I'm just giving you time if you want to find it. There are a couple words in there that mean things that we don't always think of them meaning. One is the word resist. In here it says, do not resist an evildoer. The translation resist is inherited from the King James Bible, which was commissioned by King James. There may have been an interest in King James of making it sound like you should not resist any oppressor. In fact, if you go back to the, the Greek, it has much more a sense of do not take up arms against your oppressor. Do not stand in battle opposition to your oppressor. But instead, use that oppressor's honor against them. So hold on to that. Let's also look at the end of this passage. Be perfect, for therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Does anybody else want to have a heart attack when they hear that sentence? Yeah, yeah, that's impossible. I'm just going to tell you that right now. We'll, we'll cut to the chase. But the Greek here also has a sense that is helpful. The Greek is telos. The Greek is a sense of persistent unto completion. Don't give up. Be persistent, even when you've been warned and an explanation given. Be persistent All right. All right. All right. to get toward justice, to get toward a place where all people are loved, okay. where all people are given voice where all people receive the just mercy of God. This passage is reminding us that even when we are struggling with oppressors, that God persists, and therefore, like God, we must persist. The world may ultimately reject that entire sense, may ultimately kill all the efforts, but we are people who believe that even death is not the end of that persistence toward the kingdom of God. And so together, as we read through the whole of this passage, you can see that there's a slightly different interpretation that asks us not to be a doormat, but also not to wear a suit of armor around. It asks us instead to be artists of love, to be creative interpreters of the world that we might help people see the world of love in a different way. I'm particularly thinking of the art of martial arts. You may know about judo or jujitsu, which is the art of using the other person's power to throw them off balance and to create a new balance. It is as Walter Wink suggested, and I'm gonna borrow liberally from Walter Wink here, not to submit to evil, but to refuse to oppose it on its own violent terms. To say that we will not render evil for evil an eye for an eye, but we also will not be silent when injustice is present. We will in, find, we will in fact find ways to raise everyone's bar a little higher, to find ways to lift up everyone in love. Now this is hard. 
This is hard. Les will tell you I have cried over this, trying to figure out what are the ways that we can do this. But I think Walter Wink's work is important and helpful. And I know some of you have heard this, some of you have studied it in, in depth. But I will, for those of you who have not heard this, give a brief description. There are a couple of things in here that Jesus asks us to do that do not immediately make sense in our context. One is that if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. The word right there is important because it was in that society an honorable thing to throw a right hook, but a dishonorable thing to throw a left hook because the left was considered unclean. And so if someone slapped you on the right cheek, what they would do is take their clean right hand and backhand you on the right cheek. That is an insult in that culture. So if you turn the other cheek, what you're doing is saying, you've got to treat me like an equal. If you're going to fight me, come on. But you're not going to fight me as inferior. You're going to fight me as your equal. Similarly, if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give them your cloak also. This is an example of the holiest of embarrassments. People were sued in court at the time by wealthy landowners to get even more money, the poorest of the poor. In fact, there was a Levitical law that said, you can sue someone for their coat, but you are not allowed to keep their coat overnight so that they could have something to sleep under. That's how poor the people are that we're talking about. It was also true that there was a Levitical law that if you saw someone without clothes, the shame was on you. So, if someone sues you for your cloak, and that and your undergarments are all that you have, and they get your cloak, and you say, here, I owe you even more, and you give them your undergarments as well, you are left in your birthday suit, <laughs> and the person is left with a little shame, because they have taken too much. Similarly, it was a Roman law that if you were a Roman soldier, you could compel anyone you met to carry your heavy pack for one mile because they were humane. You could not carry it for more than a mile. So when you got to the end of that mile and you said, oh no, I'll take it another mile for you, you caused them either to recognize your humanity or to break the law. It's tricky business. It's a way of being so overwhelmingly loving that it forces people to recognize the oppression that they're doing. It is a way of using nonviolent resistance to shame evil itself. Now you will know that I am not a huge advocate of shame. My, my uh, usual line is that sunlight is the cure to shame. But sunlight is also the way to shame evil. Sunlight is also the way to say, look, I'm making it very clear what the balance here is. I'm making it very clear that you are acting oppressively. There are tons of examples of this in the New Testament, especially the women characters in the New Testament who were, in fact, persistent. There were people like the widow and, and the judge, the widow who kept coming to the judge's door over and over and over until he finally realized he needed to give her a hearing. The Syrophoenician woman who said, aren't I at least as good as the dogs that you would give crumbs to? The woman who will look over and over and over for her lost coins. Mary who will sit at the foot of the teacher even though that is not the woman's place. All these people who say, I am choosing the side of love to the point that you have to question what you understand as the proper societal culture. Frequently, they're also using humor for the sake of dignity. If you were that person, if you were sitting in that court where someone handed over their undergarment, you'd probably giggle. It's funny. <laughs> The way of using someone's shame against themselves, someone's honor against themselves, is so surprising. 
that it causes laughter. It causes a way of, of re-envisioning everything that's taking place. And this can happen on societal levels and it can happen on interpersonal levels. Uh, one of the, the movies that we enjoy watching is Overboard with Goldie Hawn. Uh, and in this movie, the quick synopsis is uh, a really rich and nasty woman um, who has wronged a carpenter, uh, falls overboard, gets amnesia. The carpenter comes and takes her in and convinces her that she's his wife and that she has to clean up his pigsty of a house and raise his three kids. And they are mean to her. They are getting their revenge. They are getting an eye for an eye. And it's this sort of battle of her feeling like, I don't know what's going on, and they're treating me really badly, and they're saying I'm supposed to be in this role, but I don't think I am. And finally, they get to a scene where the kids put glue on the bottom of plates and said, hey, will you give me pies? And she goes and gets them pies, and then she's stuck with these plates on her hand. And she's walking around with the plates, and she gets so fed up that she finally just manages to hook the water sprayer and just spray them all with water. Water is nonviolent, I will say, <laughs> generally. <laughs> and the tension of this breaks everything. She's able to say, look, you people are being ridiculous, and we're all being ridiculous. And it, it cracks open this new sense of maybe there's a way, a, a new way that we could do this. There are also ways that humor has been societally helpful. Uh, in, um, in the Serbian rule of Slobodan Milosevic, there was uh, a group called Resistance, which uh, in Serbian was called Optor. And an example, they used subversive humor all the time. An example of one of the things they did was Milosevic's wife, Mira Markovic, forgive my pronunciation, um, was known for saying that the communists required blood to get here and they will not leave here without blood. So basically saying, come on, there's gonna be a battle. And so the Optor movement all went to the blood donation center and donated pints of blood and then said, here, here's our blood. Could you go now, please? <laughs> it's a way of saying we don't have to live like this. We can, in fact, love each other. There is an Ethiopian proverb um, that I think demonstrates this, and uh, some of you may need to forgive the imagery here a little bit, but the Ethiopian proverb is, when the great Lord passes, and the Lord being sort of an oppressive character, when the great Lord passes, the wise peasant bows deeply and silently farts. <laughs> There are ways of saying, I know you have power, but you don't get to rule my soul. In a more serious way, it could be someone who is consistently beaten in a relationship in a way that the bruises don't show, to somehow, when a blow is coming, turn so that the bruise lands in a very public place, like a face and to walk out in public with that person and saying, he always gives me the best. To let them know that their shame, that they are trying to make you feel, is not on you, but on the one who inflicts it. There's an example of a South African squatters camp who was ordered to leave by the Afrikaner oppressors. They were told to get out so they could build a subdivision. And the women, knowing that the Afrikaners had a similar thing about people in their birthday suits, just took off all their clothes and stood right there and said, come on. And the Afrikaners screamed and fled. <laughs> and the squatters remained. All of these, I think, are really fun, creative ways of nonviolent resistance. But they're hard to come up with. And the reason they're hard is because they require the person in the position of the oppressed to know their own value, to not be fooled into thinking that I can, 
I, I must live under the same things that this person is telling me to say. They are fooled into thinking they are less than. But the gospel of Jesus Christ says no to that. The gospel of Jesus Christ says everyone is beloved of God. God has made of one blood all peoples of the earth. The gospel refuses to let the people in the position of the oppressed believe what the oppressors would have them believe. But it's hard to do. It's hard to do. And so Jesus gives us a way here. And that way, strangely enough, is prayer. That way is praying for yourself, but also for those who persecute you. Because one of the deepest ways towards spiritual growth is to learn that you are part of God's whole fabric of love, as is your enemy. And in knowing that, you rise above the systems that are designed to keep one person down for the benefit of the other. Through that prayer for our enemies, strangely enough, fear of the other dissipates. Love of the other comes in. The prayer for our enemies may not, in fact, affect the enemy, but it will affect the prayer. It will change the prayer, and that will affect the whole system. We are given a definition of what it means to love our enemies in 1 Corinthians. St. Paul gives us some indication that I think is helpful as we think about ways to pray and ways to encourage ourselves, whether we feel oppressed or whether we recognize that we may have some oppression to let go of. Here is what Paul says with some of annotations by me. Love is patient. This whole thing takes a while. We are not gonna get our immediate relief. Love is kind. Loving our enemies does not mean beating them down, does not meeting, mean taking their eyes when they have taken ours. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, which means that we have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. We have to be disciplined in our prayer and in our turning to God for help, always, always, always. Love does not dishonor others, but in fact, calls them to their own values of honor in a deeper way, calls them to a higher honor. Love is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. More discipline required for that. Lots and lots of discipline, lots and lots of prayer. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. We use that word rejoice a lot here. We use the word joy. And that's because it is the most subversive power to be joyful in the truth of your blessedness, your grace-filledness, your rightful place in the kingdom of God, and to rejoice in that rightful place of all those others in the world whom God has created is indeed a delight. It takes a lot of prayer to get there, but when you do, it is a delight. Love always protects, especially the vulnerable, always trusts that everyone is doing the best that they can and we're all actually trying to do the right thing, even if we sometimes need to be called out. And finally, love always hopes, always perseveres, always persists. Let us, friends, go forward trying our best to love our enemies as we love ourselves and to love ourselves as we would love our enemies. For in that, we love God's created kingdom in a way that changes the world. Amen.